boy screws loose, let him strip the bolts on him. Should have never sent him to pick up the work for him. Sprayed the park and had my shit inside the car. Marcus Smart Boy was shooting with a 36 on him. Said if he wasn't in a rush, they was all gone. All right. Greetings, shuttlings. Welcome to another episode of Chuddy's Corner. It is Friday, February 5th, about 10.30 p.m. here on the Eastern Coast. Uh, Celtics get a 139-129 win, or 133-129 win, uh, in a battle with the lowly Washington Wizards. Uh, definitely one of those games that uh, <laughs> kind of raise the blood pressure a little bit. Uh, we're going to break down all that game. Before we do that, though, uh, I'm your host, Dugouts. With me as always, uh, Chuddy, King Chuddy, how you doing tonight? Doing well. First team in the league to 40 wins. Uh, they say, used to say, I think it was Phil Jackson or one of those old coaches used to say you could tell a contender if they get to 40 wins before 20 losses. So uh, did that with ease. And honestly, at this point, it would be kind of disappointing if we didn't get to 50 wins before 20 losses. So hard to really be too upset. Yeah, I didn't know that adage. I feel like that's got to be adjusted a little bit for the modern NBA. No? 40 mm, wins, 20. Nope. Well, you're not, not sure why that would change. I don't know. Uh, winning. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, my brain's mush. I've been traveling all day today. Um, it was nice to get home, though, just in time for the Celtics game. Um, make sure you're following the podcast, wherever you listen to your podcasts, uh, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, however you want to do it. Uh, make sure you're also going on our uh, YouTube page, hitting the subscribe button on the YouTube page. Uh, and check out, as always, Chuddy'sCorner.com, your home for all things Chuddy. Website has been uh, really going pretty crazy these last couple uh, couple days. I think we launched like two weeks ago or something. But we get a lot of traffic there, a lot of people reading your blogs, um, a lot of good information there, Celtics and NBA related. So if you um, want to get some the inside track on everything going on in the Chuddyverse, make sure you're checking out Chuddy'sCorner.com if you haven't done so already. Um, and lastly, special shout out to our sponsor, Nick Prano Real Estate. Uh, check out nickprano.com for all things real estate. Um, he'll get you hooked up, best in the business. Um, but now we turn to the game again Celtics 133, 129 win over the Heat. Uh, over the, oh my God, over the Wizards. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Take it over, Chuddy. What did you see in tonight's game? I'm gonna uh, get a well, cup of coffee or something. That team was definitely not the Heat that we just played. I'll tell you that much. Um, no. It was kind of just another one of those games where you show up, and I don't want to use a bunch of cliches about kind of going through the motions and playing down to the competition and coasting <laughs> and this and that. But, but I mean, we it, played it really down to the team. We it, it was a little bit that. Yeah, no, and you could see it. Right out of the gate, uh, I mean, one of the earliest takeaways I saw was this team just cannot guard anyone. Um, and obviously, they just <laughs> traded their starting center. They didn't play a center the whole game. They had Kuzma down low. So they were basically just playing a bunch of wings um, and guards, insanely small ball, trying to play fast. And we were kind of just letting them off the hook. Um, it seemed like every time we decided we were going to drive or work the ball inside, we were scoring almost in comical fashion with no resistance whatsoever. It was like layup lines at a certain point. Uh, every time we threw it to Porzingis, he basically was shooting like practice shots over an assistant coach. It looked like almost um, <laughs> was getting the free throw line left and right. But um, I thought, you know, not enough commitment to kind of doing the right thing, forcing way too many shots, a lot of threes. The threes were not falling at all. And we were l playing at their pace. Like obviously with that small lineup and the way the Wizards just run and gun and don't play defense, they want to fly up and down the court. Uh, and Celtics just didn't want to run with them, at least at the beginning of the game. It was just 18 fast break points in the first quarter, which is just insane. Um, and more than anything, shows that we just, like, weren't getting back on defense. Like I said, a lot of just kind of, like, settling for jump shots and then kind of watching the ball while the Wizards run up the other end, shoot, and shoot a lot of threes, and a lot of their guys got going. They hit a lot of shots. A lot of guys who maybe don't usually make threes were. Um, so they were, like, getting up more threes than us, making them at a way higher percentage, and otherwise we were kind of just going back and forth almost we weren't providing really any defensive resistance and i mean i thought our offense was fine i thought the first quarter was pretty ugly after like a strong start they they could have been up really by a lot of points the way they were playing we had tatum hit a three at the end and then peyton hit a half court shot they kind of i think cut it down so whatever we lost the first quarter by five or so um felt like it could have been down like double digits the wizards were playing yeah. well we were not uh, I thought it was a little better in the second quarter. And, I mean, again, our offense was pretty much fine as long as we remembered to drive the ball to go down low. Uh, we'd have kind of, like, bursts of 
sustain good offense here and there, but then kind of fall into a little bit of just like, all right, I'm going to dribble and ISO or just take a step back this possession, whatever. Again, threes really uh, were not falling whatsoever. And the Wizards closed out that second half. It was pretty much just a back and forth game that felt just kind of like slogging along. And then the Wizards just had a flurry right at the end of the half. Out of nowhere, kind of went into the uh, locker room with a seven-point lead. They put up 71 on us, which should just never happen. Um, And we scored 64, which, again, a lot of points. Like, the offense was fine, but didn't felt like it was far from our best offense. And, again, I mean, part of that, they are just so bad on defense that it felt like we should have been scoring way more points. Um, Third quarter, that was kind of the game. Uh, Celtics basically locked in for one quarter, came out in the third and cleaned up their mistakes, did not let the Wizards get out in transition, uh, focused on doing the right thing on offense and capitalizing on the matchups that were out there and just like locked down on defense, started picking them up almost right when they came across half court, pressuring the ball, forcing them into bad shots. And, uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding. The Celtics won the third quarter, 36-16. I think it was the only quarter where we didn't let them score like 30, at least 30 points. Um, And it was Mm -hmm. way down. And you could just see the difference in focus, the difference in execution, the difference even in like schematics. There were some minor adjustments made, um, but I mean, it was just a completely different game. And we we're just completely focused on, like I said, dominating the paint, getting the ball inside. It was the Tatum show and the Porzingis show. Uh, they both, I think they had, I think they combined for, it must have been almost 30 points, just the two of them in that quarter. They scored almost all the points. Porzingis, like I already mentioned, they didn't have a center, so it was matchup hell for the Wizards. They could just go to him at will. I think he's, it had to be, I don't know off the top of my head, that has to be close for his career high on free throws. I think he was 14 of 14 from the free throw line on the night. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Tatum, 35, 10, and 8. was completely dominant despite shooting 3 of 10 from 3. So again, it's like so many times he just decided to settle for that step back, and we've seen some games recently where it was on. Tonight, it felt like if he really wanted to just keep driving, they had absolutely nobody who could match up with him in terms of like anything, size, speed, athleticism, strength. Uh, so it was basically getting to the little basket for a layup or a dunk or like a close jump or anytime Tatum wanted, he probably could have gone for 50 or so if he was committed to the plot. But um, again, it was like, they've kind of felt, okay, we're going to show up for one quarter, take over this game completely. They went from down seven and a half to, I think up 13. Um, and Peyton had another three quarter court shot that was about a quarter of a second late or uh, would have been up 16. Uh, like I said, just completely dominant quarter. That was kind of what you would expect from this matchup. Fourth quarter uh, started a little slowly, but I thought the defense was still good. I think the final score was a little misleading as the Wizards just caught absolute fire really in the last like two, three minutes. I think they hit four, five mm-hmm. threes in a row. Got the yeah, lead, we, got it all the way down. I think they yeah. had four threes and then got an AM one. Got it all the way down to like a four point game where it felt like we were just cruising to an easy double digit win. That fourth quarter was mostly like a 12, 10 to 15 point game. Uh, I thought the D was fine. And again, like the final, I think they ended up, the Lizards ended up scoring like 42 points in the fourth quarter. But uh, I'm pretty sure with like three minutes left, we were up 15 and they'd only scored like. 20 points. So overall, I thought for the most part, the second half was fine. Uh, Wizards shot the absolute piss out of the ball, made this game closer than it could have been. They had a lot of guys who actually played really well, especially on offense. Um, And the Celtics, again, not a great three-point shooting night whatsoever. Only shot 34 attempts for the Celtics. That's like basically nothing. Um, so to have the Wizards attempt, get up more shots on us, get up more threes on us and make way more threes on us. The Wizards made 20 threes. It was one of the best three point shooting nights they've had, I think ever as like a franchise even. So, uh, we had a stretch earlier in the year where it felt like every team that played us just could not make a shot and the Celtics would be red hot. Um, and you get a game like this where we probably win like 30 and it seems like we played amazing tonight. We get a game where the Celtics weren't buying threes and the Wizards shot their way into the game and those things are going to happen. But at the end of the day, we cruised out of there with a fairly comfortable win. I kind of disagree with you. I never thought the blood pressure got too high. I don't, I didn't ever like really feel like the game was in doubt in the second half. So uh, I, again, I think the final score, you know, I would like it to get that close, but I never really actually felt like there was any uh, real pressure. Yeah. I mean, maybe it just, maybe it just might be prone to high blood pressure anyway, yeah, but I just, we're used to it, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I think uh, I thought the defense, again, this is, I guess just in the first half, the defense was like horrible. Um, it mm-hmm. just it just seemed like they really had no no focus. And again, in a single microcosm of a game, not a big deal. But it, it, we talk all the time about habits, and you can't give us credit for when we have like these great games and these great habits, and not like take something away from when we mm-hmm. come in and are, are displaying bad habits. So it's concerning because we've talked a lot about building that stuff now in the regular season. Um, again, yeah, did I ever think we were really going to lose the Wizards? Not really, but it's just kind of frustrating 
that we play down so much of their competition. Now, the good thing about that is that there's not going to be any bad teams in the playoffs, so we don't have to necessarily worry about that side of it. But right. I do think there's going to be teams that aren't as good as us, and if we just kind of always make them interesting like this, uh, the Chuddy's Corner page tweeted out, like, it, it feels like the guy from the Jigsaw guy from Saul. Just mm. like, I want to play a game. It's like, no, let's just fucking, <laughs> let's just, like, destroy them. Yeah, I don't want any, well, like, sicko shit. But even the worst team we're going to play, like, let's say we play the Pacers and the Magic. Like, I really, did, I think we're still going to take that seriously and not be like, ah, it's like the Wizards. <laughs> they don't have to show up. Like, I, yeah. I don't really fear no, that I don't in think, the playoffs. No. Yeah. Um, it, I think uh, Porzingis, I, I don't know why they should have just been giving him the ball every time yeah. in the post, like, I mean, the whole that game. They kind of did, like, it, it seemed like at some point in the third quarter, he looked, like, pretty, like, tired or whatnot. That qu- he took over that quarter completely. I mean, him and Tatum, yeah. like I said. And he, was, he seemed gassed by the end of it. If he was. was even like, one time when Tatum went to pass him, he was like, no, bro, don't do that. Yeah. Like, he played almost the whole quarter. Um, Peyton Pritchard, uh, those half-court shots, I just got <laughs> I just got to mention the Dick Leip stat. Um, at Dick Leip, he's the Comcast Sports Net, like, stat guy they had there. So it says, with his three-pointer at the end of the first quarter, Pritchard became the first Celtic to connect from 50 feet and beyond since Gerald Green at Indiana on April 12, 2006. That's just like a crazy <laughs> stat. Like, I, I don't know what kind of wizardry that that's guy awesome. has and what things he has access to, but that's awesome that he has that stat. Um, yeah, that is. Ready I guess I, we, we can get into it a little bit later. I did want to come back a little bit on uh, Jalen Brown's three-point attempts. I don't think he had one this whole game today. I think he was 0 for 1. He shot did one. he have one? Okay. Yeah. So... Um, I have a stat for that too, but before we get into the kind of the additional stats and stuff like that, and a, a little bit about just the Celtics against bad teams in general, let's talk <laughs> a little bit about Porzingis and Tatum because those two combined for uh, 69 points tonight. Tatum had 35, Porzingis had 34. Mm-hmm. Um, we would just mention a little bit about Porzingis just being able to kind of shoot over anybody. I thought if they went to him every single time, he could have gotten like, he could have gotten 60 points tonight. Yeah. Um, and Tatum just being a, super aggressive and attacking. I feel like so many of his points came around the rim and by going to the hoop. So I, that's what I like to see from them. I don't know how you, if what you, I mean, obviously you liked what you saw, but what do you think just about their <laughs> yeah. game overall tonight? Yeah. Well, I think it almost tied into a little bit of like your foreshadowing where you mentioned Brown. Um, I thought, you know, Brown was fine, but had kind of like a quiet game by his standards. Derek White obviously had a very quiet game as well. And I think part of that is what we said. The Wizards played without a center. They literally just didn't have a guy, which I want to say happened when we played the Wizards earlier in the year. Like, Gafford was obviously still on the team, but I want to say he, like, wasn't playing for some reason, and they played small against us again, and uh, Porzingis just, like, went off for whatever reason, but... Uh, yeah, I think it's 24 it's, points against former teams. I don't know. I don't know if you heard that stat. stat in the broadcast. Great spite <laughs> stat. Love that. Um, but, no, I mean, that, like I said, they can't... Kyle Kuzma's already... <laughs> Just a outrageous mismatch to put on him. So, yeah, they go to him every time. And, I mean, there's a trickle-down effect then. So the guy that they probably should have guarding Tatum now has to guard our center. So that just slides, like, one less guy uh, down the ring. So, again, if they had someone to guard Tatum, like, it probably would be someone like Kuzma. Now he's bumped up to try to guard Porzingis. He's overmatched. They've got guards bumped up trying to guard Tatum. They're overmatched. So those two guys just had the (laughs) most clear and obvious mismatches. Um and again, like, that's what you want to do. You want to keep going, going at that, and that's what we did. So, like, it, it's it's a good thing, I think, like you said, that the Celtics are able to recognize that and that they were just force-feeding Porzingis, who's, like, you know, the third option. We've got two all-stars out there, and they're willing to recognize, like, okay, this team doesn't have a center. We have a 7-4 scoring machine. Let's keep giving the ball. Like, I don't care. You know, Jalen Brown's like, I don't care about getting my stats and chucking up threes. I'll throw it down to him and let him score or get fouled every single time. And like I said, in that third quarter, we won the quarter by 20. That's all it was. It was Tatum driving. Um, and if they were, like, sending extra stuff at Tatum, just dump it right down to Porzingis. Easy bucket. Um, and they were kind of going back and forth. And when you get that going, you know, scoring consistently like that, too, is a good way to limit transitions because it's hard to – it's hard to fast break uh, when you're taking the ball out of your own hoop every time, too. So it's like a two-sided thing right there. Um, but, I mean, again, I thought, obviously, they both played well, but so much of it, the matchup just dictated, like, it's going to be these guys' night. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, you're probably, I, I did forget about that game we played before where it was Kuzma having to play center then, and, and I think we said basically the same thing, that that's just, yeah, it creates so many problems, and it becomes a domino right. effect kind of thing. And I um, think also, too, it almost took them, a, like, a couple of quarters to realize, like, we don't have to work to get matchups. I think we're so used to like running elaborate plays with different screens, trying to create like switches yeah. and mismatches to get the advantage we want. And then they finally just remembered like, 
oh yeah, like it already is a mismatch. We don't even need to run like a pick and roll. Port Zingas can just post yeah. up and we can just I mean, walk down think, to him and he already has like that a wing. whole first half we were doing like anything on offense. It felt like we weren't like running or like calling or communicating at all on offense. That was that was brutal. But what I thought the, the offense third was, quarter, was whatever. Like I thought that in the first half it was really just the defense. I mean, it, we, we score 64 points a half on a, when we don't shoot threes well. Like that's, <laughs> you can't do much better. I mean, the Wizards again just absolutely suck. And like I said, little... It just, was just so, it, yeah, like, again, it wasn't our, like, beautiful like game. Like, I couldn't but, believe Tatum had as many points as he has in the first half. Like, it didn't feel like he yeah. was doing, it yeah, was but very quiet. I think it was just any time we wanted to, we could go to the rim, and it was like, you could just dribble past your guy. It was layups left and right. Like, it really was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so did, so I guess, I mean, we can kind of go on to the next sort of thing I want to talk about. Just Celtics, just against bad teams in general. Uh, we've obviously seen them struggle. We know what happened against the Lakers recently. Uh, we even struggled uh, with the Detroit Pistons when they were on their like big losing streak. Um, so again, I don't think like in a one game thing, it's much to like be too worried about. I don't think that it's going to be a kind of thing that's going to change the overall projection of the season. But I do think that there's got to be like some level of like concern or like annoyance or something like that. Um, just about it. it. It's it's. I don't know if it's just like the fact that we just want to enjoy ourselves watching a game again. Didn't think this game was going to get lost, but just what? What is it? Is it coaching? Like, how does that happen to a team where they just come out flat? And <laughs> it's like like a pattern now of coming out flat against these bad teams. I mean, is it really though? Again, I mean, like these are all yes. mostly for the. Yes, it really is. Uh, you mentioned okay, one a game tonight that we won, and really again that made closer in the last two minutes than it really was. Like it was a pretty comfortable win. So you don't think that there's a you don't think there's anything about the Celtics coming out flat against shitty teams? No, they're forty and twelve. Like how many shitty teams have they lost to all year? Two. <laughs> I'm not saying lost to. I'm what saying you do come out flat, make the game like make in it a more difficult. Season, I think you, the key there's been games times like, we've like we'll get a chance to rest guys and have and you know. Rest guys at the end, and they end up having to play the whole game to win. Yeah, I just think in the NBA, like, any team could play good on every night. Every team is approaching the Celtics again. Like, it's the biggest game of their season. They all want to come out and play well for the Celtics. At this point, it's about basically, like, exerting the least amount of energy you can to ensure victory. And, like, for the most part, that's what we're doing. Like, these are nice kind of easy, like, relaxing, comfortable wins. You thought we exerted the least amount of energy tonight? Uh yeah, pretty much like a we basically gave it all our all for one quarter. I would think that guys not having to play the fourth quarter would be exerting a lot less energy. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm not like holding the minutes they played for most of the first half against them. They were jogging back and forth for cardio. Like I think they're fine. I don't think that I don't think there was a lot of wear and tear on their body in the first half. <laughs> I don't know. I I I didn't think that this would turn into a debate that there's been games they come out flat against these shitty teams. I mean. Maybe, like, they obviously didn't come out their best and could come out better and with more energy, but, like, we keep saying, I just don't think that's a realistic expectation that you're going to see the best version of the Celtics at 100% to start every single game uh, against these bad teams. Like, it's, again, we say, it's human nature. You look at how both teams are approaching these games. It's hard to get hyped up. You go into this right, game but, knowing that we have you're nothing making to gain the and everything to lose. Huh? What you just said there is describing that it's happening. You're just saying it's not a big deal that it's happening. But it's happening. I get I. I guess it's happening to a extent. I just don't agree with the coming out flat part. Like, I don't think there is. I, I don't know. Yeah. Don't it's know. not, um, we it's not something that I think is like a habit of like playing bad against. I feel like for the most part, we crush bad teams. Once in a while, we get a game like this where the team hangs with us. And then on like a, the rarest of occasions, we've lost a couple games that we should have won. But again, in most of those games, like go back to that Detroit game. I don't like, the, we didn't play Grizzlies great, but I thought it, I remember it more. The Grizzlies game, we just beat them by 40. Yeah, but the, not the first half. The first half was close. <laughs> Again, like, I just feel like we're moving the goalpost so much. It's like, all right, so... I said they come out we flat. We won a game by 40. They come we out flat. We ha- so we have to be winning by 20 at halftime against every bat team that isn't as good as us, which is every team. Like, I just think the bar is being set too high. Like, I don't know. It, teams it, are no going to play... No oh, bar. What? Just, they come out flat against bad teams. They end up winning. The Grizzlies, they won by a lot. But they came out flat. I don't know. I feel like there's been plenty of both this season. There's been games where it seems like we're up like 20 to 5 in the first minute. Like, 
maybe mm-hmm. recently, maybe not as much, but again, I think it's more just to do with the point we're at in the season and like what we're looking at in terms of the schedule. At this point, we're like, Cobb probably got one eye on the all-star break, getting some more rest, and then it'll be kind of like a ramp up for the playoffs where it feels like, knock yeah. on wood, like our seating position is pretty good at this point. The emphasis is on like being healthy, being well rested, and then, like I said, a little ramp up before the playoffs start, kick into gear, and you know, hopefully have that one seed locked down. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, I have no concern about that part of it. Just, but then that's but that's like what team. it's all about. And we're a podcast; we got to talk about something. <laughs> oh, I guess. I mean, I I look at a game like tonight, and I see the Wizards came out, and like I said, sh- had an amazing shooting night. Like they just shot the shit out of the ball. That never happens that the Celtics get beat like that on the three point line. Um, so I mean, again, we talked about like statistically, that's just usually a game where you're like, ah, shit. Well, they just dominated us shooting we're not gonna win that game the Celtics still won the game and pretty handily um the Wizards also I think Scal, I think I heard Scal mentioning this at the end of the game I added in my notes from the beginning of the game whereas like again we have to remember like these basketball players are human beings that entire Wizards team has been looked at as like every single guy is just an asset they're just like a contract that's like a, holding a spot for a future person they hear themselves talk that every single day. No guy on that team wasn't in trade rumors every single day. So the day after the trade trade deadline, I, like there has to be a sense of like relief of like, okay, I at least know that like I'm not leaving tomorrow. This is where I am. I think there's a comfort, a looseness, a little bit of like, okay, this is our team now. Let's go out and play. And like again, I thought those guys played really well. Like I, I, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't some of it. Yes, the Celtics can play better. Some of it, I think, especially on offense, the Wizards did play really well. Um, I think they threw us, you know, for a little bit of a loop with the uh, small ball stuff where they came out in the first half and really pushed the pace on us. And we kind of just like didn't react fast enough, weren't ready for it. Um, and then again, switch things around in the third quarter. And <clears throat> I don't know, like go back in the year, the we would say other games where we're up 20 at halftime and then, oh, oh we come out flat in the third quarter because we're up 20. And it's like, Today, we absolutely came out and punched him in the face in the third quarter yeah. and played 12 good minutes, and that was the game. Oh, yeah. Like, we won the game. So, I guess it's just like you can't have your cake and eat it, too. And, yeah, I guess if you want to say, you know, we're playing the Wizards at home, we should win every quarter by 15. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. But, again, if we even if we did that, I just don't – is that even more, like, productive for the end goal of winning a title? If we – like, I, I don't know. I feel like this is just what it is. Well, I think either one would have very little <laughs> – bearing on that i just think it's sure. just it i just thought it was i i feel like i've noticed a pattern of this like of, of mm. making these games more difficult and closer than they need to be against far more inferior opponents yeah i guess there's something i'm gonna to have to that, compile I, a list I, I think the bigger takeaway and that what shouldn't be lost in that is that 90 percent of the games you're talking about are wins for the celtics at the end of the day we're 40 and 12 easily have yeah. the best record in the league yeah and like I, I, I mean i don't know like I said, there's been more than enough games where we've come out and absolutely dominated. So the fact that like the bar now is at close wins, um, it, it's just you know I don't know. It's tough. Like I said, we have a we're six and a half games up on the Bucks now. Uh, Sixers are a thing of the yes, past. Yes, like, agree with all of that. I agree with all of that. I yeah. just like I said, not panicking. Had the button <laughs> here. The button is not recorded. I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's more to I say annoyance. I think it's I think it's absurd to even bring up something like a panic button. <laughs> it's not a panic button today. It's just an annoyance button today. All right. Wow. Well, all right. <laughs> um. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, a couple of things from from this game I kind of mentioned before. Um. Uh, the Jalen three pointer. So he's one for six, sixteen in his last five games. He only shot it once today. Mm-hmm. You already kind of alluded to it that that tonight. That might have had a lot to do with the fact that the uh, that it was just made way more sense to pa- pass it into Porzingis, um, <laughs> and to go inside himself. I mean, t- Brown, what did he shoot? He was like nine of 15, 9 of thirteen. Like he had a good, efficient yeah. scoring night. He could get to the basket at will. So that's like, I feel like that's what we ask for with, from the Jays when they can get to the hoop. Like, do it. <laughs> so to me, I mean, I don't know what what your take was going to be, but like, I have no problem with him just focusing on easy baskets at the rim and otherwise oh, deferring yeah. to better shots versus feeling like going into every game, like I have to get five, six threes up no matter what. No, I just, I just didn't know if like, mm. if the, if the, if I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think if there's the shots inside, I do think that three discrepancy was, you know, part of the reason why this game was so close. Just when you look at the numbers, but um, I'm fine with him going in. It's just more like, I hope he doesn't kind of feel like he just shouldn't be shooting threes or something like that. Like, yeah. I, don't, I hope he's not like kind of in a little kind of right. 
you know. No, I don't think I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I, that because I'm not I mean, shooting him well. Yeah, no, and he's definitely in a little bit of slump. But I, I think the not shooting is more matchups and what the defense is giving him than anything else. And I still like when he gets good looks. I still absolutely have confidence he's going to make them. So again, I mean. Long season, little slumps. We've seen it with other guys. We've seen super hot streaks with him and other guys, and I think it's just kind of going in and out of stuff like that. Right now, he's obviously in a slump. Um, no need to force it, and he's not. So I have, you know, I could see another game where the matchup dictates him shooting, you know, eight, ten threes, and I wouldn't say that's like an eyebrow raiser either. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I have no problem with him shooting threes, and I, I don't think it was that. I think it's a lot, lot, lot the matches, but one for sixteen in his last five games. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that shot does end up coming back for him. But that's also only what three, basically three attempts a game. So yeah. like in, in general, I feel like his numbers have been down more, and I don't. I think there's something to be said for like the best version of this team is kind of like Tatum and White running the show, uh, using Porzingis a ton in the offense, and Brown just being like a secondary guy who is on the weak side and can attack closeouts and like punish the D when they're in rotation and get to the basket. And I feel like that he's absolutely been getting inside and scoring like those super high efficient baskets for him. So, I mean, I, I, I love that. And that's a good way to get his game going when his shot isn't going like, what do you have 18 points tonight without really yeah. hitting any jump shots? It's pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, the other guy I want to talk about, uh, Drew holiday had another really good game tonight. 20 mm-hmm. points, seven rebounds. Uh, this is my two- quiet 20. Yeah, but I felt like he was just, it was like a real blue collar. It's twenty. Like he was down. I feel like he was just getting down yeah. low in the paint and just banging. It was yeah. pretty awesome to see. I mean, again, they. Have, I feel like it all is tied to their playing small, where you scale down every matchup is like one matchup too small. And they, I mean, they had guys like Tyus Jones trying to guard Holiday, and he's just taller and probably twice as strong as him. And Drew Holiday sees a guy sees like a true small point guard trying to guard him, and he's just going in the paint and treating it like he's a center, <laughs> which I yeah. love. Easy um, pickings, smart player. And does not miss corner threes. Sixty <laughs> percent leading the league in corner threes. Scal said, "Who Holiday? Yeah. Oh, nice. That's a great little stat. Mm-hmm. Um, another speed of threes. Uh, we, we mentioned him before. Obviously, he had the two long shots. Uh, I thought Pritchard was awesome. Like he was being a dog mm-hmm. two on defense. Yeah. Um, I love that, that and one when he pump faked and waited for uh, I think it was Pool to like land on him and then finish the layup. <laughs> yeah, that I, was great. He also, I love the play where the ball was like tipped into the back when he got it. Mm. And, like, we got to see some real flashes of the old fast PP right yeah. there. Like, he got right towards the hoop and kind of just, like, froze and stepped yeah. back and kind of just shot, like, a really close jump shot. Yeah, um, that was great. Yeah, it was, Pritchard was awesome to see tonight. Uh, played mm-hmm. really well. Uh, I do think just on the wizard side of things, that game, that guy, Avia, Avia? Denny Avia. Avia. Fuck. Yep. I, I, I got the J right. Oh, respect um, the bit. Yeah. <laughs> that guy can ball. He he was he yeah. was he was he was hitting some crazy shots. I don't know if that's just like a thing like you said, where guys just going to be coming out like hot, or if he's actually like considered an asset <laughs> so think, with them or not. But he, I think he the looked he looked a few good. Guys who could be like good to like great, maybe not great, but like really good role players on a team. They're just like don't have the stars on that team for them to play that role. So mm-hmm. they're all kind of like overtasked. But I think if you put Advia on a good team with like two stars and he's like the fourth guy, you'd be like, wow, this guy's like a really good role player. I mean, he was a, they drafted him like seventh or eighth pick not too long ago, high lottery. And I mean, you can see he's pretty big. Uh, he could shoot, he can take it. He's got some like toughness to him a little bit. So no, he's a good player. Um, I mean, and yet another guy who the whole year you're like, is he on the trade block? Like, is he part of their future? Is anyone part of their future? The Wizards <laughs> Do they have just, a like, future? Do they have a future? Are yeah, they able they, to become I, the Seattle Supersonics? <laughs> right. I mean, the Wizards, I, I'd have to look, but they probably have drafted between, like, 8 and 12, like, almost every year for, like, like, 10 years in a row, and almost every single one of those guys has been, like, a miss. But again, it's hard to say if they're a miss because it's just, <laughs> they don't have a star, and you can't have a right. team full of role players, like, even if some of them are good. Without the stars, like, again, there's no role players, like, there, because they're all just trying to do too much. Like, I think Corey Kispert looked pretty good at times. I think Kuzma, obviously, has proven he can be a good role player. Uh, Poole, I don't know what the hell happened to him. Uh, Draymond punched his skills out of his body, but he is, Although, was obviously there was a good role player. Although, there some points today where he, I thought I was wondering if there was someone courtside that was, like, I was going to say that the, the, baddies. the garden... Yeah, is that, is that what it is? The baddies? Yeah. Uh, like I was going to say, the garden needs to round up all the baddies and boot them up to the balcony. Because yeah. he, he was playing pretty well in that first right. half. He was but, making some crazy, crazy shots. But all those guys, again, I mean, we've seen Poole be a good role player on a team that won a title. We've seen Kuzma be a good role player on a team that won a title. Tyus Jones has been a really, really good role player on a playoff team. Um, Advia and Kispert, high draft picks who seem like good role players. They just, 
again, they're playing like almost fake basketball with no defense, no it's center, like rec league shit. and no like go. It's like who should be the go to guy? I think is another problem. And I think they had five guys who scored like between 17 and 25 points tonight. So they it was kind of the rare case where they all had it going. But on most nights, I think that's the problem where it's like, okay, Jordan Poole, like you should not be a team's number one option. Kuzma, you shouldn't be a number one team team's option. But all of them are probably overtasked to be like a fifth option. You know what I mean? So it's like a team made up of all like third and fourth options. And yeah, I think a lot of them are probably pretty good. Maybe they should have tried to trade more. I don't know. Um, one other thing that I think bears mentioning, I, as you know, watch a lot of basketball and watch almost every team in the league. The Wizards, they, I don't know. I'd have to add it up, but they're very, very close to the team I watch the least in the entire league. Um, but I will say I'm impressed by uh, Brian Keith, the new coach. They made a change and you could tell they're playing like, Watching them early in the year, it was like, they literally just look like they're rolling the balls out, and it was like an open gym, and they're playing, like, <laughs> rec league-style ball. It looked like they had a little, like, strategy tonight, knew what they were doing, made some decent plays, so, uh, and it just seemed like they were playing kind of harder, uh, different style, so give him a little credit there. I think he's doing some things right, um, and again, I think, don't underestimate the fact about the clarity that, like, at least for now, they're not getting traded in the immediate future, so they can kind of focus on, like, all right, these are the guys who are here. This is the team. Uh, Bilal Kulubali, who I haven't mentioned yet, their rookie this year, who I actually do think looks like a keeper. Again, another guy who I'm not sure if he'll ever be a star, but he does look like a really good two-way player. So they've got <laughs> Except now he's going to have to be a bigger role. In front of well, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, well, and the, the, the other thing I mentioned too, like half-jokingly, is that they were, they, it seems like they were in the lottery every year, but they never have like a top five pick because they're just... Yeah refused to they have refused for so long to just accept that they suck and truly like blow it up until they finally did this last offseason which looking back now is insane to think that they traded Beal and Porzingis and didn't get a single first round pick back um but <laughs> but like that's what happened because they waited on them too long to blow it up till it was too late and those guys had no value anymore so the new owners came in uh hired the new GM or whatever and they finally are like okay what the hell are we doing we're not chasing the eight seed every year we're just gonna blow it up they traded everyone the result is what you see on the court now but at least now they like have a direction and they suck and should be drafting in the top five for one so it's like if I was a Wizards fan, as awful as the season's been, I'd be like, finally, we're doing the right thing, because otherwise we're just going to live in, like, mediocrity to badness for perpetu perpetuity, and that's, like, what happened. And it's also just funny that they traded both of those two guys, didn't get a first, um, but just traded Daniel Gafford at the trade deadline yesterday and did get a first, so... Uh, trading and Daniel valuation Gafford, for the NBA huh? is a funny thing. And, I mean, Gafford's <laughs> a good player, but, obviously, uh, yes. to say they sold low on Perzingis would be an understatement. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of all the picks too, the the interns about to lose his health insurance for the tweets he was saying like what happened that I was like said something like where I was I said how good I thought Xavier uh, was for us, but then mm -hmm. I then I was saying I was worthless second round picks are and I use a second round pick. Okay, first of all, okay, name like the other like ten or fifteen second round picks in that round. They're probably fucking worthless players. Like just put that out there and. Just like overall, a, a, a player, a person is much different than like, I don't know, what a second. I feel like T Tillman's going to be like pretty decent for us, but he's 25. He's been in the league now for a while, which by the way, crazy that he's 25. I saw him talking and I go, I thought this guy was young and he is. He's only 25 years old. He just looks like a, he looks <laughs> like a, like an adult, like a TV dad from like the 90s he or something He's got like three that. kids. Uh, I think that was one of the scouting report from Memphis is like, this guy is an adult. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, he, he's an adult, he's mature um, beyond his years. But yeah, so intern, you, you're on thin ice. If you wow. don't, there's still time to cancel your health insurance for this this year, I think. Yeah, but I think what he's trying other. to say is right in regards to second round picks. Where yeah, obviously they're not all going to be good players, but you look around the league, there are a lot of good players who are second round picks. These guys got to come from somewhere. So right, now you're, yeah, I'm not saying, but I'd say the majority of them, I'd say, aren't. You could probably say the same thing about first round picks. I don't find picks all that valuable at all in the NBA. <laughs> They're very valuable right now in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just don't get it. Like, I get, I get they are. Any, I do think it's worth how much someone's willing to pay for it, basically. But I just think it's like sometimes it's very bizarre. Like you just said, they didn't mm -hmm. get a first-round pick for those two players, but they got a first-round pick for insert name right there. <laughs> so Yeah. How um, did um, the Celtics get to where they are right now, do you think? Trading second-round picks to you, say? Acquiring no, but picks. trading to get draft picks and yeah, <laughs> trading yeah. players for a shitload of draft picks and then using those draft picks to draft all NBA players. Right. Yeah. If you can get a pick in the, but every, I'm saying if you get a pick, obviously it's going to be the fifth or I'm sorry, the sixth, the third and the third pick. 
then yes, that's or the first pick, but you trade in the third. I don't Charlotte think any Philly. team ever intends for that to happen when they make the trade. <laughs> yeah, but no. All right, we're not getting into this. The, the intern just needs to watch his fucking ass. <laughs> that's all I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah. spe- speaking of the Tillman <laughs> trade, uh, we went into the Tillman trade pretty in depth on last uh, our episode on Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. So if you are looking for some Tillman information, go check back in the uh, around the uh, episode against the uh, Hawks from last last Wednesday. Uh, but we did get a fan that reached out to us with some thoughts on the Tillman trade. They heard your thoughts on the Tillman trade. It's our old friend, Jason in Newburyport. Um, so I'm going to play his voicemail, and then we'll kind of use that as a springboard to get into like our big old around the NBA trade deadline uh, extravaganza. So Jason uh, from Newburyport, here's his thoughts on the trade. So the Celtics got a six foot seven center that's injured. <laughs> Some guy from the G League, YMCA League. Oh, but he's a great rebounding center forward. Six foot seven center. And this is what we're excited about, boys. This is Jason in Newbury Port. I'm not in my bedroom. Ooh. And I am wearing clothes. Oh, that's too bad. We're really excited about this. <laughs> Come on, guys. All right. Uh, so, Jason, obviously, uh, disagree with you. Well, in, in his clothes, thinking right, uh, I think in a good mind frame to, to say this. I don't think you can plead and sand or anything like that. Um, so, 6'7", he looks bigger than 6'7", but I also think that's not necessarily a deal breaker. But I'll let – I think he was responding to kind of what you said. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I was all hopped up on guard and vibes. Sure. Uh, so, for that. so go, go ahead. First let of Jason all, know appreciate- why it's a good deal. First of all, thanks for the call, Jason. We appreciate it, of course. Uh, love yes. all of our fans. I think he makes a lot of good points. I want to start by saying I think really we just need to adjust what we're considering like excited. So are we excited in the sense of like we're not? I don't think anyone's saying we just we just grab like a star player or even a starting caliber player or even a guy who's a lock to be in our rotation and get major minutes. But this isn't Bill Walton coming. This is not Bill Walton, but I think we we knew that realistically going into the trade deadline, like we knew what we had to work with, we knew what was out there. Um, so I mean, we're excited about adding a potential like depth piece at an area of weakness is is what we're excited about. Um, he's sit, listed at six seven, six eight. He is two hundred fifty pounds. He does have a seven two wingspan, uh, so he plays bigger than his height would suggest. Um, and he, again, he's athletic. He moves well. He might be undersized to play center, but he can also play power forward. He'll be able to play next to Al. He'll be able to play next to Chris Stapps and Luke if needed to. Um, and then he'll also be able to play center, give us some a better, a different look in some smaller lineups. But that's, you know, comes with the territory. He can switch onto guys on the perimeter. He can guard some wings outside. He can switch onto guards. Uh, you've probably all seen the video out there of him switching on to guys like LeBron, Kawhi, uh, Zion, guys like that who, you know, traditional centers who might be taller, but they're you know, they're not going to be able to guard that. Chris Haps Porzingis is Porzingis has six, seven inches on him. He's not switching out onto those guys. So again, it's just about adding versatility, different looks. Um, and again, bol- just bolstering the depth. He's an insurance policy. He's a guy who can come in and give us some bench minutes here and there. He'll definitely help us out during the regular season, give us a chance to rest some of those guys for the playoffs more. Um, and again, so I mean, I'm excited in the sense of, I went into the trade deadline saying we have very little to work with. We just needed a few adjustments on the margins. Let's see what we can do. I'm excited that in that sense, I think we did a really good job. You look through the course of NBA history, how many finals teams went out and traded for a guy at the deadline who was like a real big part of their rotation. It's, I'll give you a hint. It's a very short list. Um, I know like Marco Aguirre from the Pistons comes to mind. Um, they traded him out for Dumars. Uh, I think Marcus Gasol was a mid-season acquisition by the Raptors. But again, like, that's kind of the point. It's very rare that these teams are making these kind of moves. And it's, that's, I mean, we knew going into the season, our guys were set. Our top eight was basically set in stone going into the deadline. It was like, look, not just at what we were looking at. Look at the entire landscape of the NBA and the trade deadline yesterday. Like, was there, how many guys were traded in the entire league? That More than I talk about it. Well, right, but I'm I'm saying out of the trades that went down yesterday and in the last two days, how many guys were moved that you're like, ooh, like he would have been clearly in yeah. our top like eight guys? It was a very weird deadline. It was like a lot of movements, but I don't really know what – I mean, I'm kind right. of open so, for you to explain again, a lot of them. Well, 
I think it's just, again, there just weren't a lot of good players who were available on the market and the teams that wanted to upgrade had no assets to give. So again, like did the Nuggets didn't add anyone. The Clippers didn't add anyone. Um, the Bucks, their big move was adding Pat Beverly. <laughs> like, um, who you know, already had, the league, like, already had his hands on the clipboards and I don't know if you saw that clip. Yeah. But, I mean, again, so my funny. point is like, if you look at the the other teams considered to be like the top tier contenders, yeah. they didn't add anyone either. So again, I think we can be, it's, it's twofold excitement where it's excitement that we gave up, you know, almost nothing. Lamar Stevens, who's a fine player, but obviously not a part of the team now or in the future um, for a guy who could potentially help us this year play a role, maybe similar to like a role that a Grant Williams played for us last year, which you could say, you know, was he a huge part of the team? no. But he had some important moments. It's a good guy yeah. to have. If it's, right. if we solidified our ninth, tenth spot on the roster, like that's good business. And like you mentioned, he's a twenty-five-year-old guy. We'll be able to re-sign him. You know, the, the elephant in the room, kind of that nobody wants to talk about, is that in this next year, year after, the team's going to get very expensive, very fast. It's going to get untenable. They're going to have to make some uncomfortable decisions and probably let some guys go that we don't want to see go. And we're going to need cheap guys who can play. Um, and there's a chance Tillman could be a guy like that. Was there a chance Stevens could? Frankly, no. So, um, you know, again, Jason, we're not excited. Right. We're not over here popping champagne bottles like this trade just won us the title. But we're looking when you are trying to win a title, it's like you have to tie up anything that could be a liability. And it's like we might think we're set going in. But, hey, if we can improve our ninth man by a little bit and raise our ceiling and maybe our floor and maybe give us a better look for the future, like – that's a move that you want to do. And these are the kind of moves that, you know, you look around and you see teams that you don't get what they're doing. And it's like, Brad seems to know exactly what he's doing and he's just going out and getting it done. So again, I think it's like, if you had, if you went in with the right mindset and the right expectations, I think it's okay to be excited. If you're thinking you're going to wake up the day after the trade deadline and there's going to be a new star in Boston, then yeah, you're probably not going to be super excited. All right, Jason, I hope you enjoy that thorough uh, <laughs> explanation of why, uh, I'm, and uh, and I think Jason voicemail. will like Jason strikes me. Tillman strikes me as the kind of guy without knowing Jason well that I think he will take to once he watches him play. Uh, Tillman is an absolute menace defensively. He brings hustle. He brings toughness. He brings edge and energy off the bench that I think you'll see right away. Um, and again, he makes up for what he lacks in height with wingspan, with uh, strength, and kind of the way he can move. He averages over one steal and one block a game, one of the leaders in the entire league for stocks, despite playing way fewer minutes. And he's in the 98th percentile of uh, defensive efficiency per minute. There's only three players in the entire NBA ahead of him. So uh, I think let this guy get a chance to play on a really good team, and uh, let's see what he can do. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I think I'm anxious to kind of see what the guy can do. Um, I think he's kind of came and he said, he's kind of saying all the right things. He said, Marcus told him to just play hard and think people here will love you. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Uh, I do think the only questions I have now are everything that uh, Jason just said. He just planted now the seed of doubt in my mind. So you did a good <laughs> job kind of erasing some of that. But I understand where you're coming from a little bit, Jason. Uh, but I, I do again, if, if Tillman, no, 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 you said enough on this, but the, no, but the last thing is just <laughs> oh again, God. if he doesn't play a single minute, like what, whatever, no, I know. you know what I mean? Even if it's a complete disaster, we have eight guys in court with Cornette being the ninth. Like we don't need Tillman yeah. to like do what we want to do. He's just insurance and like a bonus. I think he kind of, I'm hoping might kind of one day, maybe something similar to kind of like Al. I feel like he kind of is similar yeah. size, sort of this undersized. Exactly. I know he's a little bit smaller than now, but can p cover all four positions and stuff like that. Right. Um, but yeah, it remains to be seen. Again, he was injured tonight. That is something we should mm -hmm. when can we expect him back real quick. Real quick. Um, I would think after the All-Star break, but they said, I don't think they've said yet for sure. It's probably too soon to tell, but I think we'll get a meaningful update around then at least. Okay. All right. Well, again, Jason from New Report, thank you for the call. We do always appreciate it. And every everyone out there in the Chuddyverse, if you want to reach out to us, um, go ahead. We're reading the best ones on the on the air. Um, go to chuddycorner.com to see a little logo for a microphone shape type thing, and you can leave a voicemail for us there. You can also leave comments in the comment section. Uh, you can also send us like messages, like uh, I don't know, comes to us as an email. I don't know what it looks like. I think if you just go to contact us, you can do that. Uh, if you have questions or anything like that, um, we're definitely keeping an eye on that and pulling some of the better ones for the air. Uh, Jason, one of our longest serving uh, callers, so. Uh, anyway, the trade deadline, we mentioned it, got got down to business on that. Why don't you go ahead and give us a little, uh, well, not a little, big recap on what, what happened around the league. Like I said, I feel like a lot of these pieces that were moving 
we're like such and such for who's a what's uh, and a couple <laughs> picks. And then it's like, well, this trade is weird. Then it's like, well, what this trade actually does is creates a this for this team. And then now they're able to move this and do this. So I feel like it was like a very complex web type trade down. There wasn't like that big move. Most of the big names we talked, we heard about possibly being on the move uh, didn't end up getting moved. So it was, it was like, it was a kind of a very strange world. Like when I was, when I was catching up on a lot of the things that were happening, I just was kind of just like, I need, I need Chuddy. I need to know what is, <laughs> who are these guys and yeah. what the hell does all this mean? So um, go yeah. ahead and kind of give us a little run around what happened. Well, I think again, we've kind of talked about that a lot of the bigger moves had already happened. And I think that was teams realizing like, okay, there isn't going to be some big thing that pops up at the deadline. So let's go and make this move now. So again, Guys we've already seen move in season before the deadline include James Harden, Terry Rozier, Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi. Those four guys were I would better, probably considerably better, all of them, than anyone who got moved at the actual deadline. So Definitely. that's part of it. Right. So I think a lot of the big fish were already out of the way. And then the guys we kept hearing about, Levine, you know, the combination of him playing his way off the market and then getting surgery. Like, he basically took himself out of the picture. Yeah. Uh, the DeJounte Murray and guys like Kyle Kuzma, who had more years and, like, decent deals, I think at the end of the day, their teams were just like, we don't really need to trade this guy just for the sake of trading him. So, again, I think part of it is the play-in tournament has made a lot of these teams in past years where teams like the Hawks and Bulls might just be like, we have to sell, are now like we could get into the playoffs like and for them you know they look at that as better than just blowing it up for no reason especially if the offer they want aren't out there and it sounds like that's the other thing is like the teams who are desperate to make these upgrades are teams that are like oh we can give you one pick in 2030 and yeah it's like hey, i think we're good like yeah, yeah and yeah. Dejounte murray's like a fine player he's still young his contract's fine like they could try to do this again next year so I think that's a big part of it is there just wasn't really that much out there um and then like i said the teams who really want to upgrade for financial reasons or strapped for assets, just didn't have a lot to, to give. So you just didn't see a lot of deals get done. Um, I think the big winner of the deadline was the Knicks. Obviously already had got Ananobi, went out yesterday, added Bojan and Alec Burks uh, from the Pistons, mm -hmm. two really good shooters, gave up Quentin Grimes, who's like a solid young player, but not a guy Tibbs is really trusting, giving a lot of minutes to. Um, and in all of these deals, the Knicks still haven't given up one first round pick. They've bolstered their rotation. So the Knicks have been... Playing like one of the best teams, they'll now, uh, Ananobi got surgery on his elbow, Randall's injury is obviously very questionable, he'll be able to return at all, but the Knicks, quietly, like, might be the Celtics' stiffest competition in the East, if you haven't been paying attention. Which is um, crazy to think, but yeah, yeah, they have been playing, they've been playing so well lately. They've been playing like it, and again, I just don't Jalen think it's Brunson's a huge fluke. Good. And they're one of the few teams out there that I can look at as, like, they clearly got better yesterday. Uh, really good moves partially to hold i think to hold the ship while those guys are out and partially they'll have a really deep and really really versatile rotation if everyone does get healthy for the playoffs so really good piece of business by the knicks um some other teams i mean you saw again like no massive deals you saw the thunder uh swap a few guys to get gordon hayward we've obviously seen gordon hayward <laughs> yeah. if he can stay healthy i think that's a really nice addition for them big if but again Gave up pretty much nothing, so I like seeing that from a team like the Thunder, who's a little ahead of schedule, and figures, hey, if we can, you know, take a shot. Again, they didn't give up any first-round picks. Uh, got Hayward, who's on a huge expiring deal. They had the money to make it work. Uh, didn't give up anyone in their rotation and got a guy who could potentially be in their closing lineup if he, you know, could be healthy and stuff. So could be a nice move for the Thunder. Did you see um, the video that guy tweeted out that was like, the Thunder just added this guy to the lineup? This is what they're getting, without... yeah, and it's highlights when he's and in, it like, was... Butler. Yeah, it's playing, like, Lob City Clippers. <laughs> yeah, and shit. I know, oh, I know. Good. Um, yeah, but like, was I that mean, intentionally again, meant to be funny? Do you think I that don't works? think so? But okay, maybe it might have been just for engagement, you know, yeah, that's you a know. great bit, right? But I mean, I think the point is, like, if they can get even a, a piece of that, like, yeah, they, they, they basically get... need him to be like their fifth guy, and if yeah. he can be, you know, his old self as their fifth man, that would be awesome. And a guy who's like a vet has experience, um, isn't someone the defense could just leave alone. So that could be a good move for the Thunder um, in the playoffs if he can be healthy. Big if, obviously. Another team, one of the few teams we saw really go for it, the Mavericks, uh, basically emptied their asset chest. They gave their last first round pick, the 2027 pick, to the Hornets for PJ Washington. They already gave up on Grant Williams in that deal, uh, gave up on him after half a season. He was their big offseason signing that they gave up a big, a risky pick swap and some seconds to go get him. They've already dealt him with another first to get PJ Washington. Um, and then they had to go rent a first from the Thunder to go get Daniel Gafford from the Wizards, as we mentioned earlier. So two big moves for the Mavs, which I think make them like better. But again, I'm not, I'm just not sure how much better. Like I know Grant was struggling, um, but I, I'm not sure like 
in the aggregate, PJ Washington is a big upgrade. They're basically the same age. They play <laughs> a very similar position and role. Um, and have a similar, like, everything about them is kind of similar. They're, like, two very different players stylistically, but I think they provide a lot of the same stuff, and the value is very equal. So the fact that that Mavericks would throw that good of an asset to swap Grant for PJ, to me, is, like, a very questionable move. Um, and they've set themselves up again. They have no more picks. So if this season ends poorly, which I don't think would surprise anyone, um, and Luca starts to give the side eyes to the Mavericks, yeah. that could be... That could be, again, one of those picks where you look back and are like, how the hell did they give up these net picks that now teams are picking in the top 10 for them every year? Uh, they're playing with fire, but honestly, I'm not really sure they have any choice. They just have to do everything to keep Luka. They're trying their best. Um, and like I said, some risky moves that I don't particularly love. I guess it came out today that I think it was yeah. Tim McMahon from ESPN who said that the that Grant just rubbed the Mavericks the wrong way and they like had to get rid of him no matter what. And then part of the thing that angered them was that he like didn't like Luca's shoes and he switched from them to wearing Tatum's shoes again. So like, yeah, that, I don't know because they just don't want to, they just don't want to piss Luca off kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't like, know. They just don't do all like the players Grant, have which to wear Luca's they shoes. They wouldn't be the first people to not like Grant, but like I said, Grant's. I mean, he's a solid player, and he's a guy who could help you in the playoffs. PJ Washington has put up some nice stats, but if you're digging in and watching the Hornets, I don't. I'm not sure he's a great player. I'm not sure he's going to help them that much in the playoffs. So again, to give up a, Grant, who they just signed, and a first round pick, like that to me yeah. is crazy. I mean, um, Grant was a solid player for us. I don't know. I guess it still remains to be seen if he's like a solid, just overall NBA player. I mean, he he had a really good situation right. he was in with us and benefited. I obviously hope for the best, but there was. Long stretches of the past two seasons where he just wouldn't even be playing games with for us. Like mm-hmm. there were stretches where he was just well, right. Uh, I'm not bench, so much so. saying Grant is like awesome, but I just also am not convinced like PJ Washington is mm-hmm. either. I think Grant might go to the Hornets, fill the PJ Washington role. He might slot in as their four and like defensive anchor and play 40 minutes a game, and suddenly we'll be like, oh, Grant Williams is pretty good. And then in two mm-hmm. years, someone will be like trading for Grant Williams for the same package. Like yeah. I just think him and PJ Washington are very similar, which is like probably solid role players in the right setting but again i think it kind of just speaks to the market that dallas was so desperate that they had to give up an awesome first round pick that's only top two protected uh for again a guy who's at his best is never sniffing Mm -hmm. an all-star game or even close and that was probably like one of the biggest trades of the day so i think the biggest takeaway especially from a celtics point of view is looking around and just being like i think it was a good day for the celtics just in the fact that none of our competitors really got better so again, going back to the excitement level of adding a guy like Tillman, it's more just like we made a slight improvement on the margins and none of the teams that are chasing us or that we're chasing made improvements at all. And then the bigger story to me, if anything, the biggest story of the deadline was all the teams we've been hearing about for months, the Lakers, the Warriors, all these teams that need to do something that weren't able to do anything at all and just kind of sat on their hands. And again, obviously there's nothing out there. I think part of it was the Lakers front office conceding like we're not good enough to give up all this stuff for 40 year old LeBron when like the team's just bad. Um, so. Yeah. Interesting stuff there, but, uh, you know, again, I'm happy to go into the minutia of every little deal that went down. Um, there were so many of them. Well, that, before again, you do that, we'll have I, little... I, I wanted to kind of point out, because you mentioned, like, it was kind of more about the the rest of the league not really doing a whole lot. Um, mm. I was looking at, they had, the like, the there's a chart for basically, I think, Sham Street tweeted out, um, basically of, like, what teams were before the deadline and where they are now for their, like, current mm. odds. So I think there's just some, like, interesting ones in there. So the Celtics went from a plus 320 to a plus 260 again. I don't think that's because we traded for Xavier Tillman. I think it's because of the teams around us, because the Bucks went from a plus 460 to a plus 550, so there's some movement the other right. way for them. Um, the Nuggets more or less stay the same, plus 420 yeah. to plus 440. I mm-hmm. think some of the big movers are the Clippers, who went from plus 1400 on January. This is from January 1st, so it's so, not right okay. before the so trade wait, deadline. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and now, but now they're a plus 550. So yeah. I think some of that probably was movement anyway because of the way they've been playing. 100%. But I think the fact that no one else out in the West really did anything that crazy right. to upgrade themselves um, yeah. definitely kind of helped they got the Clippers. The Lakers or- went from plus 2,000 to plus 5,000. Um, right. So that's just, like, funny. Well, um, again, I think so many of those odds were Vegas just assuming, like, these teams are going to – they have to do deal. something. Like, yeah. they have – right. You, they don't want to give out these giant odds, and then the Lakers go trade for a star, and suddenly they're like, oh, shit, why are we – I mean, we've been hearing about the Bucks and the Lakers are going to get – you know, they're in on DeJounte Murray. They're in on this person. They're in on that person. Meanwhile, they have nothing to give, and obviously, again, the Bucks talk such a good game about improving the team, and their yeah. only move is swapping you the campaign. You mentioned the Knicks. Family. You mentioned the Knicks, too. They went plus mm-hmm. 4,000 to plus 1,600. So huge that's, move. Pretty, that's a huge jump for them. So if you, yeah. got, in a, if you got in a ticket on the Knicks uh, a couple weeks ago, you're, you're, pretty sitting pretty, you're sitting with some pretty good value on that. <laughs> yeah. Bit. 
And I mean, again, all those other teams, like I said, you're kind of sitting there waiting and seeing like, is there a team that could sneak in? Like the Cavs have been playing so well. If they went and got a really bolstered their rotation, something like, oh, a new threat has emerged. But it was almost like no new threat emerged. Or I said, like, I guess the Knicks, you could say, got better. But part, mostly, you know, more because of the injury and anything than trades. Like Philly has basically fallen out of the picture. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like the East, it seems like everyone else around us kind of is getting weaker. Um, and the Celtics are at least staying the same, if not getting marginally better. And I think before we get the voicemail line start blowing up about people saying that the Celtics shouldn't have better odds than the Nug than the Nuggets, that's just a reflection of the conferences, where I think they're saying that the Celtics are just so clear favorites right now in the there. East, whereas the West, the Nuggets, and the Clippers are both friggin' awesome. The Thunder and the T-Wolves are right on their heels. Even the Suns have looked good. Like The West, I think there's just so many more teams that you could realistically see winning it, so obviously their odds are going to be a little more watered down, where in the East, it's like, it's basically the Celtics versus the field. Yeah. Uh, don't sleep on the Cavs and the Knicks, though. I know you already mentioned no. the Knicks. The Cavs, have, the Cavs are I, I just said the Cavs, too, and I think they're another one who you're waiting to see, like, since they had played so well, like, oh, will they actually go make another kind of, like, all-in move? And again, I know they gave up a ton to get Mitchell, so they don't have a ton to work with. Their big deadline moves were really just getting Garland and Mobley back from injury. So, uh, yeah, the arrow's still just pointing straight up. I don't, the Cavs right now, I think, are two games clear of the two-seed, if I'm not mistaken. Like, they're the two-seed right now by a, over a game, so they've quietly snuck right up to that spot. Like it's all year been, we've, I think we were kind of just locked into thinking it was going to be Celtics in the one and then Bucks and uh, Sixers in the two, three. And now it's looking at that might be the four five game and Cavs Knicks might be the two, three in some order. So yeah. the East has gotten pretty wacky. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Some pretty big movers in the East. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I said it, but just to repeat it, Cavs went from plus 5,000 to plus 2,200. So they also had yeah. a pretty big jump, but I think that's a lot to do with the way they played. Yeah. Not necessarily the trade. Definitely, down. They, definitely. They've played into that. Um, yeah, it and is other crazy teams to see them as, as the two seed. That's definitely like, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's almost like, did the bomb get traded back there? <laughs> yeah. what's going on? He's probably but... asking to be now. Probably wishes yeah. he was. <laughs> oh my god, that'd be funny. Yes. Um, uh, Buddy Hill traded to the Sixers. Another trade, I think, at least worth mentioning. You know, not like yeah. a huge needle mover, but a solid rotation player who they can try to bring back next year. It just it, all the all of the Philly moves seemed very weird and like. Okay, so it's, it's like, are these moves for this season? And you're saying Embiid will be back? Are these moves kind of punting on this season? Like, again, it's the fact that they made a trade with the Bucks and the Celtics. It just seems weird. In, gen <laughs> in general, that's like kind of like, okay. I thought it was um, crazy they traded Beverly uh, to, the, to the Bucks. I don't know if that's just like the, the Bucks just made it such a need. Just the Bucks like a, need a, literally any what did they give of perimeter defense. They gave up campaign and... Uh, meaningless late second round pick. So it's kind of like, um, actually it might've been a decent second round pick. It might've been the Portland one, but either way, it was They're a second all round sick. pick. That's true. So yes, I agree. Uh, good piece of business by Philly. Obviously they, I think <laughs> I would love to have been in the room. Like what's that famous, uh, draft? Was it when like, is it like the Vikings when they want like, I forget who it was, but some NFL team watching the other team in front of them pick like Jalen Rager when they were like oh, yeah. up because they wanted like Jefferson. Yeah, I feel Philly. like that was more. Oh no, uh, yeah, it was the Vikings. The Vikings. Yeah, something like that. But I feel like that was probably the scene in like the Philly room when they were like, "Wait, like they're offering us a pick for Pat Beverly? Like, what's the catch? <laughs> like, okay." Um, yeah. so, I mean, <laughs> just hilarious, and again, just speaks to how I love how, Pat Bev breaking Pat Bev breaking that story himself too. He tweeted it out himself. That's great, but um, it's just funny. Like, A, just shows how desperate the Bucks were for any perimeter defense. They've been talking about how they're going to upgrade at the deadline on perimeter D all year. Clearly, they exhausted every resource in the <laughs> league. That was the best to do. And it's classic Doc just always getting his guys, like, always going back and getting guys that he just can't help himself from playing. Uh, he's been the Bucks coach for a week, and they're already like, he doesn't play anyone under the age of 27. He goes out and trades for a guy who probably, like, should have been in the league for, like, three years, who was obviously his former player in two different teams in the Clippers and Sixers, like... Uh, it's just so perfectly like yeah. They probably were just hilarious. like, all right, we need to find good perimeter defense, and he just yeah. they're like, here's like a first stack, guy here's like a binder that only like, players we think would be good. And he just like, I already know who he needs. <laughs> I know him. Yeah, yeah. I already know. Uh, who he and is. I mean, Pat campaign Pat. like again, campaign and Pat Beverly like are basically a wash. Uh, Pain is just off, can play a little bit of offense. Beverly can play a little bit of defense, but they're both just like deep backup point guards who, on a real contender, should not be playing. Um, hmm. And again, I think for Philly. If you're like, why would they do that? I think they know that within a few days of now, and maybe even by the time you listen to this podcast, they are hoping to get Kyle Lowry once he's bought out by Charlotte. And that will oh, be their backup point guard. The Sixers? Uh, yeah. Oh. So yeah. that'll probably, he probably would have taken the role that Beverly had anyway. 
Yeah, so that I mean that that doesn't that doesn't get my piss hot one bit. Well, what do you mean? I feel like well with the beat. I mean, I guess it's like it doesn't no, mean coming back. I, or no, not. I'm just saying in terms of why they were why they didn't mind trading Beverly. I think it's because they have his replacement lined up already. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right. Uh, is there any other like? Well, trades let's talk or? about the other Celtics trade. Oh yes, of course. There's one trade first. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So Celtics- I, this is another guy who. I mean, I know he's like a younger player. I know he's supposed to be pretty good, but we had talked a little bit before. You, you didn't think that this was this is more of a down the road move. This is definitely a future move. Yeah, Jaden Springer is not somebody who will be in the Celtics rotation this year in the playoffs. Absolutely. Um, I think the Springer move, and I think Brad talked about this a little bit, is like again. I think well, so much of the focus from like the the day in and day out of the team is like obviously we're a contender and we're all about winning it all this year but the gm has to be thinking beyond this year and again with the new cba we all know how it's going to get very very hard to keep this rolling and you have to be forward thinking and you have to make some moves for guys that you think will be able to help the team on cheap contracts down the road so that's exactly what this is uh i saw him mention how springer at still just age 21 Jaden springer is younger he said than a lot of guys they're scouting in the draft this year so they view this as almost like another draft pick, a guy they like. Sam Cassell, obviously, was the assistant coach in Philly the last few years where Springer played. He apparently was a big part of convincing them to go after him. He loves Springer. Um, Springer, you know, is a very solid prospect, a really good player at Tennessee, a really good player in high school. Hasn't really carved out a role in Philly, but he's had some nice moments. He was, um, I think... It was uh, in preseason. He absolutely went off against us one game, which is awesome. Uh, in that one game, too, this year where Philly had no one out there, he t- held his own really battling against Tatum, had some really nice moments. Um, so he's a really, really good defender, has to work on his offensive game, but he's a dog. He's an athlete. Um, so, again, I, th- I think of this more as, like, almost a- another draft pick, like a guy we just brought in as a draft pick prospect, hoping he pans out. Um, I'm trying to remember the game. I, I don't know if it was a preseason game. I or it was like a G League game. I think it was like the G League finals, maybe. He dominated. Again, I forget exactly what it was, but he's had like some of these moments that have stuck out. Celtics coaches advocated for him. And again, just felt like this is a guy who they would view as almost like adding another draft pick. So think of him as like, a you know, on the Jordan Walsh timeline more than a guy who's going to help the team this year. So again, like to all the Jason's new report out there going like, why am I excited about this move? If, well, all your, if you're living and just trying to follow along with this season, it's not a move that you should be excited about this year, but you should just be excited knowing that the guys running the team are thinking about everything. And they're like operating on that next level, already thinking three, four moves ahead where they're like, we can go capitalize now getting rid of these two uh, late second round picks. And I mean, Banton's the guy who made, went out to make room for him again, Delano Banton. Thank you for your service. Fine player. Mm-hmm. Clearly not a part of the Celtics team now or in the future. They get a guy in Doran Springer who they think really can help them in the future. Um, can be at least a really good defensive player. Hopefully develop some offensive skills and be a nice role player on this team on a, a, a very cheap contract for years to come. Somebody who will really help. So uh, I'm excited about it. And uh, I listen to a lot of uh, Sixers, you know, media and all the Sixers fans. They love this guy. Like he's one of those guys who's just like a fan favorite. The team always wanted him to get more minutes. He was one of the classic well, guys idiots. who like... No, but like <laughs> not smart Sixers liking, fans saying, who like, like hated Doc for not. He was the, this was the classic guy who like how the fuck is Doc playing like all you know the Pat Beverleys of the world over like over James Springer who was this like fun young prospect who has some juice every time he goes on the floor. Um, so Philly fans are already like I can't believe this guy's Boston just stole him and he's like obviously going to be good there and stuff. So I'm like okay, I like that uh, outlook on it from our perspective. So again, I think just a super low risk flyer um, for upside and that's that's what good teams do. They look for opportunities, they go out and kind of strike with the iron's hot and hopefully we stole a guy who will be helping us in the future. All right, yeah, add another J to the mix. What on <laughs> Jaden, Jalen, Jalen, Jason from Newberry Port, whole bunch yeah, of Jasons Jason. in the mix. Um, <laughs> All right, cool. So, yeah, I guess yeah. we'll keep, keep an eye on that guy down the road. Um, a little bit closer down the road, we have the Heat coming to town. Um, mm-hmm. we're, or no, we're going to the Heat. We're going to the Heat. Yeah, yeah, this is the end of the, this is the, end of the home stretch. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been at home forever. Um, so, we're Five heading down to Miami, Miami, a Super Bowl Sunday matchup, early game, 2 p.m., which is a little bit of an odd start time. I feel like 12, I know 12 yeah. happens, 12, 30, 2 p.m. I, I think it's literally because of the Super Bowl. Well, but like I just I'm saying like I feel like usually the matinee games are like twelve, twelve mm. thirty, but it's two, so it's just yeah. it's a little bizarre. But it should be an interesting kind of good way to kind of cruise into the Super Bowl. Um, 
what do you what 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 should we look for with the Heat? Obviously, we played them already. I think twice this year, two and zero so far against them. The Heat obviously haven't been playing that well. They're kind of down there in the mm-hmm. playing tournament area, but they were that last year too. Yeah. Um, and we know that what happened there. Go ahead and give us a little breakdown on what we can expect for the Heat. Anyone out? Anything like that? Yeah, no, the Heat. I mean, they've they've bounced back a little. They've had a couple of decent showings lately. Uh, pulled out some nice wins, and I mean, again, it's still one of those things where it's like the Heat just are who they are. We know they're not going to die. We played them in Miami just a few weeks ago and beat them by like forty points uh, a few Thursdays ago. And yet, like, I don't think anything of that. Um, I think there's a game to watch for. You know what you're saying? How it seems like we haven't come out with a ton of energy for a lot of these bad teams at home. It's like, well, this is a game. You know, in Miami, you would certainly there's plenty of reason to get up for that one. So that could be one thing to look for. How the energy is? Uh, if it seems like they're sleepwalking early, uh, although you know, early start after a night with that Miami nightlife could be a thing of its own. Who's just love. flying early in the morning? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the move. Um, but, I mean, I just hate games against Miami, and it's like I said, if we win by 40, I'll be like, fine, but it won't affect anything, and if we, like, play like dog shit, it won't either. Like, if we play them in the playoffs, it's just like, we know what this is. Um, <laughs> it's like, We just, like, know them too yeah. well, I feel like, at this point. So, I mean, I, I hope we'll come out with the intensity that we did last time we were in Miami. Clearly, we were fired up for that game. I feel like we went out and made a little bit of a statement. I'd love to see that again. Um, we mentioned last time, and the same reigns true, how Porzingis is kind of the the game changer for this matchup from what we've seen in the years past when we've matched up, he's the guy who can kind of change the math. And we certainly have seen that in the matchup so far this year. So I'd look for another big Porzingis game. Um, it'd be nice to get, you know, Jalen Brown, Derek White going, who had some off nights tonight, see if they can get involved on defense. Um, and again, slowing down their new Tyler hero, Terry Rozier backcourt, uh, which is a lot of hooping and not a lot of defense. So, uh, we'll see. Jimmy's cranked it up into gear. I know you were kind of calling him out. He when we played him last, he was in that weird stretch mm-hmm. where he was only attempting like ten shots a game and just like not really doing anything. He's yeah. ramped it up, had a few really good games. So maybe now the Heat have tried to start to get into playoff mode, and maybe they'll view this as one of those measuring sticks, and they'll come out and this could be a battle. Uh, you know, one of those ninety six, ninety five games that are ever so miserable to watch. Mm. Uh, that would not surprise me at all. But uh, it's the Heat. You know, we we know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it will, we'll see how the game goes. Hopefully, uh, we can have a lot of fun with it. It can be a nice, relaxing one, but typically not what you expect when you're playing against the Heat. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see what version of Jimmy we get to. Um, if we get kind of that sort of passive, I, he just just seemed like he just like had no interest in trying to win the last one. But I do know that you know they went on like a pretty bad losing streak. Now they're on a winning mm-hmm. streak, so that's like a perfect like micro like way to describe their <laughs> season. Is they, yeah. like I wouldn't be surprised if they just continue to go back and forth on winning losing streaks. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, that'd be a good one. Uh, we'll be mixing up a little bit with the heat Twitter too. I had someone, I had some guy the other day, like, uh, one of those like heat, like aggregate, I don't know, like, not like aggregate, but one of those like heat fan page or whatever said like something about the Celtics. And I just tweeted out like a, like a gif of like a mansion, just saying like the house that the Celtics own. And someone like commented like, well, you're the idiot. Like you're engaging. He makes money off your engagement. Shut the fuck up. Like, and, and, like you should know that it's like, okay. First of all, I do know God, that these God people know are that. doing this for engagement, like, but it's fucking Twitter and, and like, I don't know, we're just all addicted to the internet, so fuck off, like, yeah. Correct me if I'm mistaken, but the point if of the guys making money engage. off that, what's that? <laughs> Isn't the point of like Twitter and social right, media yeah, exactly. to engage? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you just do it for engagement. Engage. Yeah. Like he's making money yeah. off your engagement. Yeah. It's like okay, that's... first of all, that's sick. Like, how do I do that? Like, I need to right. find out how to like. It's not my money that he's getting. Yeah, because it's like people always say it, but it's like, how exactly does that happen? Because we need to figure right. that out on our end. Yeah, it's um, but yeah, but yes, I do know that that's how Twitter works. I do know that there's fucking trolls out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all have a, we're all sickos. We like to get on the internet. And we like to just act crazy on the internet. That's why. And like why as you much have as as much as I generally agree with the sentiment of just like ignore trolls, sometimes you do. I just like put them in their place. Yeah. Yeah. They need to be like brought down a level once yeah. in a while. You can't I don't know like, how the internet let... works. I, yeah. I've been on the internet for a long time. I've been <laughs> in the trenches for a long time. All right. Yeah. So shout out to that guy. He can fuck himself. Nice. Um, all right. We'll see everyone back here. <laughs> on that note, uh, <laughs> Celtics beat the Wizards 133, 129, mm-hmm. uh, end the seven game home streak. Uh, One other are... piece. Hold on. Sorry. One other important, I think, piece of Celtics uh, housekeeping in terms of trade deadline transaction stuff that fans mm-hmm. might be wondering about. In both of those deals, we did send a player out, so we do still have an open roster spot. The buyout market will be coming, so the Celtics still can add one more guy off the buyout market. Now, there is some confusion about how that works. Obviously, we'll see 
probably in the next few days, we'll start to see guys getting bought out left and right. I would imagine uh, the deadline is March 1st for those guys to be on a team if they're going to be eligible to make the playoffs. So uh, we'll have to sign them before March 1st. Anyone who gets bought out. Now, due to the new CBA rules, if you're into the luxury tax aprons, you cannot sign any player in the buyout market who made over the mid-level exception, which this year was right about $12.4 million. So to put that in layman's term, if a guy's contract this year before he gets bought out is more than $12.4 million, even when he gets bought out, the Celtics cannot sign him. And that goes for most of the contenders in the league. It's uh, There's seven teams who are in that apron. It's us, the Bucks, and the Heat in the East. And in the West is the Nuggets, the Clippers, the Warriors, and the Suns, I want to say. So those seven teams can't sign any buyout guys if they made more than $12.4 million. So like we mentioned earlier, for example, Kyle Lowry, he was making almost $30 million this year. So when he gets bought out, we can't sign him no matter yeah. what. Um, so we can only look at guys who are right now are making under $12.4 million. Anyone like that who gets bought out, we can grab them. Um, we were hoping this might be the case for Kelly Olenek. He obviously got traded to his hometown. Well, hometown. I say every Canadian, their hometown is Toronto. But <laughs> he got traded to the Raptors. It's a pretty I big definitely car. don't think they're buying him out. Um, but, again, they're probably – I'll come out with a list, you know, in the next few days. And as guys yeah. got bought out, watch the Twitter page, watch the blog, and I'll comment if, you know, they're gettable, if it makes sense, this and that. But I think the Celtics are definitely still in play to add if a guy that they like gets bought out and we can sign him. I think they'll definitely be – willing to pay and to add that guy. So keep in mind, watch, you know, for another guard, another defensive guard, a big guard, somebody who can shoot, maybe another wing player. Um, I think the Celtics will jump at the opportunity. So we might not be completely done. All right, good to know. It's one, one roster spot there. Definitely keep an eye out on chuddyscorner.com because as soon as we have a list, that thing will get posted there. Um, keep an eye on the Twitter page in the meantime. Um, we're going to be kind of just all, all over uh, the buyout market and all, all things Celtics. So we've gotten a lot of people – Pay attention to that. So if you aren't doing it yet, you get ready to step into the Chuddyverse. It's a place to be for all your Celtics news and all your NBA mm-hmm. news in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to call it All Celtics. your news. All your, all your news. news yeah. <laughs> we should start <laughs> doing just There's a nothing regular, you need just, to know about the world and yeah. life. That you we should just start doing like a two-minute like uh, <laughs> discussion about politics. just like, <laughs> And we'll just like randomly splash it somewhere in the podcast. Um, Celtics win 133-129. Beat the Wizards. Um, head to Miami for a Sunday uh, Sunday 2 o'clock game with the Heat. We will see you guys after that, before the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl winds up being a blow. Turn on Chuddy's Gordon. Turn, turn Chuddy's Gordon off your Super Bowl party. Um, we'll see you all there. Chuddy, have a good night. Peace out, Chuddy. Ed.